I was born right around here and raised right around here. I was born in Vancouver and grew up hardly a mile from Vancouver. I mean, from up where I was born, the old St. Joe's Hospital and, and downtown Vancouver. And uh, when I was out of high school, I decided I was going to move away from Vancouver and live the high life, live, live high and free like a hippie. And so some friends of mine came and they helped me pack some paper bags up with my belongings and then we moved across the Columbia River. <laughs> That's as far as I got. <laughs> but at the time I thought that was moving. I thought, I'm out of Vancouver. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> and I'm a hippie too. Was your mom and dad musical? My mother was very musical. Um, she and her father and, and some other people had a, um, a dance band in Minneapolis. So she was about 10 or 12 years old. And, and then when the family had to move out here, when the depression hit, um, and they, had a, they continued their dance band out here. She played the piano and her father played the violin. Fiddle. And oh gosh, she had a saxophone and a tenor banjo and God knows what else. Standard dance band kind of instrumentation. And they used to play at places like Jansen Beach. Mm -hmm. Jansen Beach had a big ballroom. A lot of big shots played there. And um, different places around Portland and, and Vancouver. Um, the the um, army post in, Van in Vancouver was a pretty big deal um, in, the, in the 1920s and 30s, and uh, and of course during the war, and they they had a ballroom which which still exists. I wanted to I wanted to rent that thing out and use it for a dance, but they weren't doing it at the time. Um, and the, it's still there. They used, to, they used to play all over the place. And as we grew up, Mom got pretty busy raising the kids and all. Pretty hard for her to play music. Um, but the, when the folk craze came along, my brother Tom and I, we really got hit by the bug. Brother Jim was in the Navy, and he was stationed down in San Diego. He got um, he got to hear some um, people like Pete Seeger, Mike Seeger, um, people who had different different kinds of interpretations and viewpoints on um, old time music, folk music, traditional music, um, and he came back home on leave with a guitar and a stack of records and uh, songbooks, like the Weaver's songbooks. And we couldn't believe it. Because you know, we were always interested in mom's piano playing. It was always magical when she had a chance to play the piano. But that folk music, that was something else. But before that happened, um, mom's brothers used to play the fiddle. They were fiddlers. They played pretty standard fiddle music. Um, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Probably the same kind of tunes you hear at at the Oregon Fiddlers Association meetings, you know, the state, the state fiddle association. Probably the same old tunes that they played. Was that in Minnesota? No, that was here. Um, they may have been playing in Minnesota. I we never got the story. I sure wish, I sure wish Mom was alive so we could get it. But we didn't get it. Um, but those guys would bring their fiddles to, to family get-togethers, but their wives had big dreams. These guys are just like car sales, you know, dressed up in fancy shoes and 
you know, white shoes and white belts, rings on their fingers. But their wives thought they were going places, and they thought, well, if you play fiddle, it makes you look too thick. But they'd bring them anyway, and mom would wait, and she'd wait, and they'd visit, visit. Finally, she'd say, well, John, George, did you bring your fiddles with you? And the wives would roll their eyes, oh, no, you're not going to get those out, are you? And the guys would go out and they'd get their fiddles out of the truck, out of the car, and they'd probably take a nip while they were out there. And then they'd bring the fiddles in, the rest of the, the, rest of the afternoon would be fiddle music. And, and that, that was magical for kids who had never heard fiddle music. It was just magic. With your mom on piano? Yeah. That was very neat. So we had that experience. And then when the folk craze came, um, we got introduced to bluegrass through um, Mike or, or, or Pete Seeger. Um, because um, we didn't know much about traditional music at the time. You know, the, the, the more old fashioned kind of country music. We just didn't know much about it. We heard a lot of more modern music, uh, Hank Williams and people like that, mm -hmm. on the radio all the time. We grew up with that kind of music, which I'm glad we did. But um, when the folk craze hit, um, mom, boy, she just. She was in full sympathy. My dad just couldn't tolerate me. He was a nervous rat. And when the music started, he'd, just, he'd get away from it. Or he'd tell you to, to take it outside or just quit playing. It's driving me crazy. But mom loved it, so she worked around that. And, um, and she, one, one Christmas, I think, I think I was probably 12 and Tom was 11. Um, she got us, she got me a guitar, and she got me a Pete Seeger's and Jerry Silverman's guitar guy, and she got Tom that red-covered Pete Seeger banjo guy. And Tom had built his own five-string banjo without knowing how, anything about a banjo. He built his own beautiful banjo. <laughs> Of course, it was really almost impossible to play. And eventually, um, they, they let him buy a, um, he had the paper most of it, but they let him buy a, uh, one of those long neck, bacon and best banjos. That was a good banjo. It was a beautiful banjo that got stolen a few years ago. But what a fine instrument that was. I, I was just, it broke my heart when I found out that he had lent it to a student. Well, before you got launched into folk music at 9 or 12 years old, did you have any formal music education outside no. of your mom? No, none, none at all. None at all. We, we didn't, we, we, Tom and I have never learned to read music. I, I learned a little bit. Um, because I got real interested in Irish music and in um, the music from New England mm -hmm. and from southeastern um, Canada. It's, it's quite a musical community in that region. Yep. Very powerful. A very powerful effect on all American music. The, the, the fiddling and the, the tunes that those people preserve in their dancing. The, the dance music really, really preserves a lot of music, a lot of fiddling. Did you ever get a chance to go back there to Prince Edward Island or any of those zones? I had chances, but not. I always passed them up. I was always a timid person when it came to traveling. You know, I just, I just like to stay home. Yeah. I was just never a traveler, and I'm. I'm sorry that I, that I had that attitude growing up and, be, and, and, and as an adult. Because I had plenty of friends who were musical and who knew a lot about that kind of music and they kept saying, come on back, stay with us, come on back. But it was, it was always difficult for me to take any kind of time off because 
Nancy was blind and she was unemployed, pretty much unemployable. And, and it, was, it was very difficult for me to take time off from work. So you played, uh, you started to play in folk music, you got hit by the uh, Pete Seeger and uh, Kingston Trio and uh, that group of folks. And, uh, and you were playing that genre of music when you moved into Portland. So when did folk, bluegrass, and old timey kind of converge onto your life? Well, that was hard to answer because it kind of kind of was happening then, really, in a, in a slow fashion. Um, the, the Vancouver Library and the Multnomah County Library. When they ask for money and donation, we donate, okay? Um, they had very good collections of um, traditional folk music. Not the stuff we were playing, you know, the Pete Seer, singer-songwriter stuff, but the folk music that people actually played as part of their lives. The music that was part of their folk lives, the real folk music. They had great collections, um, mostly from companies like Folkways, and then later County and Rounder. Um, so they had the early Roscoe, Holcomb, and and uh, yeah. Um, oh, boom! I'm wrecking. I, my brain is very useless these days, thanks to all these drugs that are pumping in there because of cancer. The Belafonte and the, and the Joan Baez and, 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 and Pete Seeger and, and all that, all that music, that got us interested, but it preceded our, our learning about um, we preceded our learning about um, the more traditional kind of music and bluegrass and, and that kind of thing. So um, I would say after I made the big move from Vancouver to the wide, wide world of, of, of South Columbia River <laughs> to the Widler Street House, um, I would say that um, my musical knowledge was slowly, slowly changing. And just before I moved, and the reason I moved is a, a friend of, two friends of my um, older brother Mike had just gotten out of the army. And one of them, while he was in the army, was found out, he was exposed to people like Jimmy Martin, the Stanley Brothers, um, Bill Monroe, Flat Scrubs, um, as well as a lot of country music and, and a lot of rock and roll um, uh, that he hadn't, hadn't been before. And, um, and, uh, and blues, country blues, and it was a piece of country blues, a lot of that. He was exposed to a lot of that kind of music. And he had a one of those. Everybody in the, in the military back then bought these reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Oh, yes. They were, they were, they were, um, I can't remember what they call them, but they, they were all made by the same people, like Ty and Roberts. Tiak, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tiak, they were all made by the same company. Sure. I think. And, um, and he recorded reels and reels and reels and reels and reels and reels of the great music. So when he got out of the Army, I got to listen to a lot of that. Whoa, man. Ooh, boy, that was exciting music. Because I was ready for it. Mm -hmm. You know, the music I was listening to was mild. Sweet and mild. And and I didn't know that I was bored with it until I heard this bluegrass, especially. Oh, boy. So, um, he got me to move in with him and, and, and his friend. Um, they had a household over there. 
um, and they needed another renter. <laughs> and um, and that, that came in the nick of time, I'll tell you. And then, while I was living over there, I met my future wife. And I think it was like, I, 30 days or 60 days later, we were married. <laughs> It didn't take long. We knew we belonged together. She played the bluegrass banjo, and I and I played guitar well enough that I could pick up bluegrass guitar. When was that, Bill? Well, that was probably 1971, I believe. We, got, we met in um, summer of '71, and we're married in September. In, in September. 24th of fifth. I'm forgetting already. Uh, September. Um, Nancy had heard, actually, it was a music party of a friend of mine. And but I, I had heard that there was going to be a, ban a banjo player there. Because she had heard that there was going to be a banjo player. And it was a guy. And she wanted to meet a guy who played banjo. She was on the prowl. <laughs> she was on the prowl, but before that story was over, she was mine. <laughs> so we got married, and um, Nancy's uncle, who lived up, oh gosh, he lived way up in northwest, northwestern Washington, I forget where or anymore. Um, he was a real music collector. He had, a, he had. Tons and tons of reels, and then cassettes were coming out. So all these cassettes, and 45s, and LPs of bluegrass, and country, and old time, and, and the kind of folk music that all fit into this blue music. And so we had lots of music to listen to. And it's amazing how much you can learn and you've got a lot of exposure. You really need it. If, you, if you're going to play old time of any kind, blues or bluegrass or anything like that, gospel music, you got to hear a ton of it. If, un, unless you're in it and live in it, and your family is in it, then you, you've got to listen to it on recording. Listen, 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 listen. All the time got to be a deep part of your life. Who was the first live bluegrass or old-timey band that you saw, that you can remember, that was the real deal? That was Doc Watson. Doc Watson? Yeah, very, very, very first. Well, no, 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 no. The very first was Mike Russo. Mike Russo and Ron Montano in Portland. And if you can find a Mike Russo recording, You've got a treasure in your hand. He put out one one LP, and it's a beauty. Do you remember when that was? Gosh, this is where we need Tom. Um, okay, I was in high school, so it, that would be in the mid '60s. Mid '60s, like '64. 64, 65, thereabouts. And those guys used to play at a, they played a lot at a, at a crummy, dark, dreary, painted, flat black, smoky coffee house full of beatniks, hippies, and the like. I guess they weren't beat, hippies, and they were beatniks. But um, they played in places like that mostly. Um, but they, they played a mix of old time and bluegrass um, and, and some blues. And, but the, the, the thing about them that, that set them apart is they tried to play in a, in a very authentic style. They tried to play in the style that they learned from. And, and that just made their music fascinating and exciting for them. You know, if they had done it in the usual folk singers, in the folk singer songwriting style, they would have sweetened it up and made it jazzy. And, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like the way they do it with new grass. 
Yeah, new grass. <laughs> You'll have to edit that one out. <laughs> I may not. <laughs> so that was your first, that was the real deal for you. And where was, do you recall where Mike Russo called home, where he was from? I, I don't. I, I don't know that much about him. He is still alive, but I, but he's, he's, I don't think he's well, and he's, um, there are people around him who make him unapproachable. And the same guy who had, um, his name is Guy Elvis, by the way, um, who had introduced me to Bluegrass when he got out of the Army with all his tapes and everything. Um, he was telling me, there's this guy you got to hear. He's a blind musician. And, and this is before I knew Nancy. This is, this is probably in 1965. Um, and that was the year I graduated from high school. Um, they said, this, this, this guy, you got to hear. He's, a, he's an amazing musician. Um, and that's, you know, that was all. You can say about it. Where, where did you see Doc? In that, probably one of the same smoky, dark um, coffee houses. It was one of those first or second floor coffee houses that's on, on underneath. What's that, what's that section of freeway that, that comes off of Fremont Bridge and goes through Northwest Portland? Is that 400 or 405? 405, yeah. yeah. It's underneath there somewhere. Uh -huh. The remains of it. So you can't go visit it and make a shrine out of it without killing yourself. So do you recall the Doc Watson concert? Oh, God, yeah. Was it a full house? I don't know about that. It didn't seem... In my memory, it didn't seem like it. You weren't smoking pot in those days, were you? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no I was, we'll add it. I was drinking. I wasn't even drinking coffee. I was eat, drinking pop like this. Probably bad pop, too. Like. Did... Uh, Vivian and Phil Williams come down into this area about that time with Tall Timber? Yeah. That was in this um, era, too. But let me tell you about Doc Cruz. Please. Um, so we went to this Doc Watson concert, and it's all dark and evil, and there's, and there's no real spotlight on him. And, and I could, couldn't hardly see, but I, I thought I saw somebody else in the shadows behind Doc. And I finally realized I did. I found out later it was his son. <laughs> Merle. Yeah, Merle. Yeah. Merle was just a real shy guy. Very shy little guy. He was a fantastic player and, 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 and he would sing with Doc sometimes. But um, most of the time, sit back there and play his guitar, play back at the guitar, and sometimes Doc would urge him to play out a little more, play a little lead. But Doc wasn't shy at all, and he played the most fantastic music I'd ever heard. But I hadn't heard any live, any real live music from a re from someone who was deep. It comes from deep in a tradition like and, and, uh, first for me, and that son of a gun played. Oh boy, did he play and sang, and and um, I didn't have any money for a record, so I had to wait a few weeks until I could scrounge up some cash. And I went down to J.K. Gill's because they used to have a, a whole big. Um, it was an office of life story. They had a big section of, um, of their store dedicated to, to recordings. And it was shut off behind glass, and you could put your records on their record players and you listen to them over earphones. So I, I did that, and I bought that Doc Watson LP, that first one that they put out, and played that thing to death. <laughs> 
Playing and playing and playing. How did that change your life as a musician? Well, it, it, it definitely pushed me in the direction of listening to, to the really, uh, what, I call, what I call authentic. What I mean is, is music that's played by the people who actually live the life. Um, it's music that's, that people use in their social lives. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a decoration or something they use for employment. Um, although that's, you know, that's part of it, of the life too. But it's, it's the people, they use it for dancing, they, they, they use it for, for singing in, in their church. Um, they use it for working, um, helping them work. Um, they sing it on the front porch. At the end of the day, families get together. Um, that's living, live, authentic folk music. And that, that really got my, my interest though. You know, there's a sound to it. You can, you can and, 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 and the music from a region where, where uh, style has a real strong, cohesive element to it, where it really is a style, um, when they play or they sing, you know you're hearing something that's different than anything you and your friends do. Uh, it's always something, it's always strong. If you hear it on a record, it might sound a little weak, but when you hear it live, it's always strong. Did, did uh, you and Nancy start playing music almost immediately after you met? Oh together? yeah, I mean, we, we, we were playing music just before we met, and then well we met, and then after we met, we, we, the, the fella who she had gone to meet slyly suggested that we three form a band, and he set up a practice at his house. And we went to his house, and and the very first practice we played one tune, and then he said, "Well, you know, you guys, I'm really too busy to do this kind of thing. I got a family to raise, so why don't you guys just sit down here and play a little music and put together a little, little doodle? You know, and be your own little band. I got to go upstairs and do some work." It was kind of. It was a little bit crudely done, I think, but effective. So oh, there we were face to face, and and we started playing some music, and and, and talking about the music, and then talking about our lives, and, and the people in our lives, and man, it didn't take long for us to decide, you know, on, on one of our drives home from practicing that. We might as well get married. What's the point of waiting? <laughs> Why wait? I mean, we, we, we love the same kinds of music. We've got the same attitude about it. We listen to the same musical sources when we can get them. The music was just really important in our lives. And anything else could be patched over or ignored. So what was your first gig, you and your wife together? Oh, boy. I don't know if I can even remember that. Wow. It's all a blur, you know. I'm sure. I'm sure. Did you have a band uh, when you first began playing or no. just a duo? No. Most of our lives, we just played together. Right. We, we never thought of having a band. And we never really thought about playing. Gigs, you know, just never, playing gigs just never fit into our our music. We were just interested in the music. We'd like to play music with other people. Mm -hmm. So we met a lot of other, other people, and we played a lot of different kinds of music. <laughs> Nancy used to play um, Jerry Lee Lewis tunes on the piano. Boy, she was good at it too. She'd get done playing a tune, she'd put that 
heel of his up on, on the keyboard and hit that last note. <laughs> you should play bang and bang, bang, bang. And then hit her, hit her heel on the keyboard and then she say, think about it, darling. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Man, what a character she was. Well, when did you get uh, interested in calling for dances? That was long after Nancy and I had been playing music. And we went through periods where we got interested in playing and playing for Scandinavian dancing mm -hmm. and Scandinavian music, Swedish, Norwegian, um, and uh, and and we also got real interested in playing Irish music. Um, we met a fella, Dan Hathaway, who taught us an awful lot about Irish music and Irish dancing, the real authentic old-fashioned old kind of. Um, Irish social dancing it's just so much fun to do and we really got into that for years and we, we also um, got interested in playing for contra dances um, Nancy and I both learned how to contra dance and we had a band and um, we played for dances around Portland and different areas and I joined the Portland Country Dance Committee community and served on the board for a while. One year, I believe it was in the early 1990s, I went up to um, the uh, Fiddle Tunes Festival. At the time, they called it the Festival of American Fiddle Tunes in Port Towns in Washington. And up there, they, they have this, um, this fella and his cousin. Mr. Joe Thompson and his cousin Odell Thompson, who had played for, and these, these both of these guys were African Americans who played for um, 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 both the black and white square dancing um, and other kinds of dancing. And um, um, I think they're from North Carolina. And um, the style of music that they played was so cool. It was a lot of the same fiddle tunes that white people played, but it had a real, real bluesy sound to it. Mm -hmm. that, I, that just really was, I found exciting. And, and there were um, some people up there who had had a real knowledge of Southern Mountain um, square dance club, which is a different kind of square dancing than you find in square dance clubs or any other kind of clubs. It's, it's um, in a lot of ways, it's simpler, but it's also more rhythmic. You got, you got to have a sense of beat to do this kind of dancing, and um, and the music is just blows you away. That's the, that's the best part about it. Um, so um, um, Joe Thompson and Odell Thompson were in the first band that I ever square danced to. And um, I was just learning how to square dance up there. So I was stumbling and bumbling around. But every time I got up near the bandstand, um, the, the fiddling to me when I was far away from it sounded kind of, kind of weak. Um, but when I got up, around the bandstand, it just had a powerful sound to it. Just an amazing, rich sound. And, um, and then the next year, I went again, and there were some, some just great dance callers and teachers, and they ran workshops, uh, um, classes in doing the dancing. And I wanted to learn how to call. Um, and I, I really had no idea how to do it. But, and, and, then, and there, was, there was very little information on it. I went on a hunt. When I got home from Fiddle King, I went on a hunt. And I hunted, and I hunted, and I searched, and I found 13 pieces of literature. You divide divided up. It was um, pamphlets, little sections buried in square dance books. Um, the, the words on the back of 
of LP jackets or 45 records. Um, some some videotape, a little just a little bit of videotape, and I think a cassette or two. And um, there just wasn't much available. And it all used different language, like they used different calls. Because every area, area had its own colorful way of calling. Mm. And every, every caller. So what I had to do was come up with a, a way of standardizing the calls. So that, I, first of all, I had to understand what these guys were calling. And then I, and then I came up with a standard way of describing what they were calling. And I put the original call on the card, on a 3 by 5 card or a piece of paper, a scrap of paper. And I put my standard call on it. And then I arranged all the, all the different calls into little stacks of standard, the same standard calls. And I had, I had stacks all over the house, <laughs> all over the house, upstairs in the bedroom. I mean, I filled out, so I was like a human computer or database. And I didn't know anything about computers or database. Those were foreign words to me. But I managed to get this thing organized. And I made a website. I had to learn how to do websites. I had no idea about how to do that. So um, I, I learned how to create a website um, for my own use. And, um, um, and then uh, made a website out of all this information. And so I could look at it wherever I was in the world and, and study that stuff. And I started studying it and listening to the recordings that I had. And, um, and I started using some of these dances and getting hired for gigs, playing for parties, mostly just all private stuff. And, uh, and um, in the meantime, I had, I had fallen in with a crowd of old-time musicians, small crowd of old-time musicians in the Portland area, um, who um, were sort of starting to get together a little bit. They're starting to meet each other a little bit. And um, one of them, Michael Mario, decided that um, um, that he wanted to have an actual public dance and invite people to. And so he hired me as a caller and put together a band. It was kind of an all-star band. I can't remember who, I mean, it wasn't an all-star band then, but these guys had become stars of the stage and screen and old-time music. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know, who, I don't remember the hall that we hired. It was an upstairs hall, and so everybody everybody started conversing on this hall. We got there early, and of course nobody was there. And I thought, my heart sank. I thought, oh, this is a failure. <laughs> Nobody's going to be here. Oh, this is humiliating. Oh no. And then people started trickling in, and I'll tell you, about every other person had tattoos all over them, or rings and all the, you know bones in their noses and the works and 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 there are bicycles they bring their bicycles right up into the dance hall and park them alongside <laughs> I, I had never experienced that and it, it was a wild looking crowd but they had the same attitude as anybody at a dance they were all excited about what was going to happen um, but me, I was looking at him and I thought, wow, it's like doing a dance in Borneo. <laughs> and, and, and that was the early 90s? That would be mid-90s. Mid-90s, by then. Right in the middle of the 90s. So, um, the dance started and by golly it went like, re went like a regular dance. Um, we just tore them up. Um, people were whooping and hollering, getting crazy. The music was getting more exciting as the evening went on. 
I don't know if I got any better as the evening went on, but I, I got happier as the evening went on. <laughs> sure. And um, right in the middle of that dance, <laughs> these two guys <laughs> decided, okay, let's be partners, but let's go behind this post and take our clothes off. Oh, and so, <laughs> without anybody seeing them, they whipped their clothes off. Well, to their chagrin, the dance that they stepped back into was a mixer. So they thought they were going to be dancing with each other and just putting on a show. <laughs> but it was a mixer, and in a mixer, you dance with one person, and then you move on. And you dance with another person, and then you move on, and you dance with another. And you move on, and you dance with another. And so here are these two guys, kind of embarrassed, with brand new partners, and all these women um, looking at them coming their way around the circle. Probably hoping the music was going to finish up. Before they had to swing them. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. And that was your very first dance. Yeah, was my, my first big club of dance. How do you follow that? Yeah, it's pretty tough. <laughs> but you might as well have something like that happen at the first dance. Um, you, you've <laughs> been and you've been very active in the or in the uh, Portland area old time music association. And wh where is that now? What kind of help is it in and? Where do you hope to see it go? Well, there sure are a lot of, a lot more people playing old time music now than there were when, when um, things started cranking up in Portland. Um, I want to correct you on one thing though. There, there isn't really a, an old time music association. But there is uh, an organization called BubbaVille.org that's a nonprofit that, that um, a attempts to um, support uh, events and programs around Portland and, and, and the region. Um, and we're, we're going to try to beat that organization up and turn it into something, um, get it more active, um, and, and I think we'll, we'll succeed at that. What do you want to, what do you want to see it become? Well, I want personally, my personal um, vision is for it to become a Re bigger than a regional organization. I, I want to, to support old time music and um, and the dancing that's associated with it. Um, clear across from from Canada to Mexico, and actually, uh, what direction is that? <laughs> I never quite get that. So it would be from Canada to Mexico, and the ocean to, to um, the Ozarks and the, Him and the um, I almost said Himalayas, the <laughs> Appalachians. The idea, the, the original idea, we, we didn't, we don't have quite the dough to cover it yet because of um, health events, me, but. Um, um, the idea is still that we want to get out there and, and, and help people who want to form a, something like the Portland Old Time Music Gathering, which is a real successful old time um, music festival. It's, it's very, it's, it's just a very cool event. Um, it, every time we hold that festival, it, it gets so many people aroused and excited. They want to go home and do the same thing. Um, well, they, they don't have the population, they don't have the money to do it, but our, our idea is to, is to give them a, a package uh, that includes 
some ideas about how to make it happen and how to avoid problems. Some support in the form of, say, hiring a couple of bands for the concerts, hiring a caller for their dancers, um, providing them with a sound system for the event, um, helping them pay the rent on a hall, um, and so they can almost, they're almost guaranteed to have a successful event. Um, that, that would be one thing we could do. Um, the other is ongoing education. Um, where um, people can learn how to play this kind of music, sing the styles that bring people out um, from the wrong direction again. Out from these to um, um, teach them and us how to really play real old time music and sing real old time songs and do the real dances. Bill, Bill, what have you done to preserve what you've learned in and uh, calling the dances? Well, what I've, what I've done is, I cannot say that I have done a lot to preserve or promote um, authentic traditional old times work. My attitude has always been to have to be a part, to have, to have a dance to be a party band. My philosophy was, it's a party first and a dance second. And I still feel that's true. But, um, I don't know that much about authentic square dancing. And I want everybody who's learning to fall now to know a lot more about it than me. And, um, and that, so I would like to get those people out here who do know it. Mike Thompson, that you talked about up at... Yeah, uh, Joe Thompson. He just passed yeah. away. Oh, did he? Yeah, this, this year. Were there any videos uh, that, that you had or he had that can be acquired? Yes, there, yes, you can, you can... There are a lot of... Later in his life, there were a lot of, of recordings made. There, there was um, CDs and I think um, probably DVDs that I've seen some film of them. How do you want people to remember you? As less of a bastard than I really am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, edit time. <laughs>
No, keep playing.